I think we've all probably heard about climate change and all will probably know this about it. But I'm just going to give you a little positive history of my involvement with climate change. Now, I remember when I was about six or something in the mid-80s, six or seven, I had a book that we got given that told us how energy was going to be produced in the future. And in that book, it had solar panels on the roof, it had wind turbines, you know, every, every area would have solar panels, wind turbines, uh, biodigesters, this sort of thing. And that was a book, a ladybird book, aimed at seven months. <laughs> <laughs> it also had an effect on me, because I now run a solar panel company, we're actually <laughs> now, 30 years later, we're now finally doing it. I don't know why it's taken us 30 years, but I do. It's the parties who've been in power who've given paid lip service to climate change rather than actually doing something about it. Now we finally are, but I've skipped a little bit. In the middle, um, in the 90s, well, it's about 89 or something like that, um, Margaret Thatcher, she's not very popular with a lot of people, but one thing that she did get right, because she was a scientist, she was able to understand climate change. So in the late 80s, IPCC was formed, Thatcher, for all the wrong stuff, she actually got climate change and she got the world to start thinking about it. Previous to that, the world had actually start, come up with agreements on, um, on CFCs, so the ozone layer. So there was an international agreement on CFCs and then there was an international agreement on climate change. Um, that set up the IPCC and from the late 80s to the early 90s it looked like things were going to go well. We had international consensus, climate change was a major problem, and we were going to solve it. Then, uh, things went a bit wrong. Basically, through the 90s and into the 2000s, the US and several other countries in particular um, basically threw everything at derailing any serious efforts to tackle it. Um, that was mainly through industry funded, like oil lobby funding and all sorts of stuff to just promote anything at all that would muddy the waters to make people think that it wasn't happening or we weren't sure or, you know, maybe we should wait until we've actually had five degrees warming before we actually do anything because then that would prove that it was happening. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like waiting until your freezers defrosted everything, the water all over the floor and then you go, okay, yeah, actually maybe we should plug it in. Um, it's a bit late by the time that's happened, all your food's gone off and everything's gone bad. So, going forward, um, in the mid-90s, the IPCC did some projections, and they predicted how much the Arctic ice would have melted by now. And they predicted what they actually came up with was that the amount of melting that we've got now, I forget the exact figure, but if you look at the graphs from then, then it would have taken to about 2040, maybe 2050, before we got the amount of ice melt in the Arctic that we now have already. So that the Arctic ice melt is somewhere around 30 years ahead of the IPCC's predictions. And at the time, people thought the IPCC were being alarmist. And that's not just ice melt in the Arctic. The Arctic has actually experienced warming in the region of 5 to 7 degrees already. That's in the Arctic, and that's because you get feedback mechanisms from the ice melts that you get black open sea that absorbs the heat and that kind of creates feedback mechanisms and now the, the ice sheet on Greenland is now melting, the permafrost around the edges is melting and when that melts it releases lots of water into the ocean so it raises sea levels and it also releases methane from the permafrost. So when you get lots of methane getting released from the permafrost that's very bad for climate. I mean, you know, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 is. <coughs> so, we're well into the feedback loops. Now, some people will say that, well, that means that it's too late. There's actually quite a lot of sceptical scientists who spent the last 20 years telling us that climate change wasn't happening with the myth. Instantly, almost overnight, they've changed their tune to, well, it's definitely happening now, but it's far too late to do anything about it. They didn't have an in-between period. <laughs> um, now, to me, they lost all credibility. You know, once, it, once it's proven that it is happening, nobody should take it seriously at all. So, I, don't, I think we should just forget about that bit. Um, climate change is a continuum. You don't have climate change or no climate change. So, the amount of climate change we have, the amount of warming we get, is all dependent on the amount of CO2 that we actually put in and the amount of methane and how far it goes. Um, so, whatever we can do to reduce 
reduce it will reduce the impact. If we can keep it to two degrees, then brilliant. But you know, if we can stop it a bit later than that, then that's better than going up to eight degrees, keep just keeping pumping oil out. Uh, so CO2 from oil into the air. Um, so just quickly, the Green Party, for the few key issues that I think basically the Green Party will take the environment seriously. It will take climate change seriously and they will not pay lip service to it. Um, in the renewables industry, in the last five years, we've installed five gigawatts of solar PV. Now, you might not know what that is, but that's equivalent to in this summer, at peak, solar PV will generate as much of the biggest coal fired power station in the country at tracks. So, five years ago, there was 50 megawatts, which means that it basically was nothing. Um, so that's installed in five years. We're now installing 2.8 gigawatts a year in the UK, and that's doubling every year. <coughs> and that's with, currently, the government keeps doing last minute changes to really basically try to scupper the industry, it seems. Um, they've now taken all the big solar farms and said you've got to compete directly on the price with nuclear, but they've already given all the money to nuclear. <laughs> so there's now no pot for them to actually bid against. So now it looks like we've gone from installing about a gigawatt of large scale solar farms in the last year to maybe 50 megawatts this year, if we're lucky. Um, and when I say it's competing with nuclear, that means it's competing on price. So solar is now cheaper. Large scale solar is now going in cheaper than the price of nuclear is being awarded to the contracts for. So whenever anyone targets for nuclear or for coal or whatever, just remember solar. The price on solar has dropped by something like 60 70 percent in the last five years. The price of nuclear has doubled in the last five years. And we haven't actually built any, that's just projections. So if anyone wants to be serious about climate change and keeping energy bills down, solar, wind, hydro, tidal, they're the way to do it. Nuclear is, you know, we haven't built nuclear for 20 years. To build nuclear, it's the French and the Chinese are going to do it for us, um, using their technologies and their, you know, and then we'll clean up the mess afterwards. So it doesn't seem like a good idea. Um, fracking, we're against fracking. Um, one thing many people don't know is we could get more gas from biodigesters in this country than we can for fracking. Even on the best projected for fracking, we can get more of the gas from biodigesters. And that is just composting waste of, that we already put in the waste stream. Um, and I believe I've been telling you to be quick, so I should just wrap up there. <laughs> 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 <laughs>